Hello and welcome to part three of the ISSB corporate reporting webinar series in which we discuss how companies can get started now preparing for the coming ISSB standards, including by using tools already widely available to companies and investors, such as the SASB standards, the TCFD recommendations, and a particular focus today, the integrated reporting framework. In this episode, connectivity and controls the path to investor-grade disclosure. I'm your moderator, Neil Stewart, Director of Corporate Outreach with the IFRS Foundation, and I'm joined live by Hiroshi Komori, our ISSB member based in Japan, and Kirsten Simpson, joining us from Melbourne, Head of Investment Stewardship and ESG at the Future Fund, Australia's Sovereign Wealth Fund. The other speakers that you're going to hear pre-recorded are Norie Takahashi, my colleague at the IFRS Foundation, also in Tokyo, Bob Herz, founding ASB member and former chair of FASB, Sherry Litton from the Institute of Management and Accountants, and Koshik Chatterjee, CFO at Tata Steel in India, who was recently appointed as trustee of the IFRS Foundation. Well, welcome to our webinar participants. Nearly 4,000 registrants from 141 countries or jurisdictions, spanning a range of functions from finance executives to sustainability officers, investors to academics. Part one of this series introduced the ISSB's approach to investor-focused sustainability disclosure and our general requirement standard, IFRS S1. In part two, we turn to climate-related disclosure with IFRS S2. This third session is on raising the quality of sustainability disclosure through connectivity, integrated reporting, internal controls, and assurance. And all the recordings and slides will be stored here on the same page that live listeners are on. Thank you to all participants who filled in our advanced survey. This helped us to calibrate the content and respond to uh, questions that you posed. Our agenda today, we're going to start with a recorded interview with ISSB member Hiroshi Komori, who is, as I mentioned, based in Japan, and next a presentation on the internal processes that are needed for investor-grade disclosure, looking beyond the ISSB to the COSO framework for internal control over financial reporting, or ICFR. Then we have an interview with Koshik Chatterjee in India. And finally, a live conversation with Hiroshi and Kirsten from the Future Fund. And please type your questions for them into the box next to the video at any time. Now, before we hear from uh, Hiroshi and Norie in the interview, uh, some context setting. And I'm going to cover this quite quickly, but you'll be able to download the slides for reference. But first of all, what do we mean by connectivity and why is it important? Today, we're going to talk about connectivity and process between the IASB and ISSB. Connectivity and product, that is the shared concepts across the standards. And finally, connectivity in terms of connecting financial reporting and sustainability disclosure, leading to better, more decision useful information. You'll hear a lot about the integrated reporting framework, which is used by some 2,500 companies around the world to communicate how they create preserve or erode value over the long term. And the IR framework drives connectivity. It supports high quality reporting and is underpinned by the integrated thinking principles. The IASB and ISSB now have joint responsibility for the IR framework. They'll work together to build on it, including further aligning it with management commentary. And over time, the boards envisage a long-term role for a corporate reporting framework. Another key role for the IR framework, the ISSB is building on its concepts to describe sustainability and help companies and their investors understand the resources and relationships, the dependencies and impacts that are part of the value creation story. We discussed this with Sue Lloyd, vice chair of the ISSB in the first episode of the series. And finally, tying in the industry view, sustainability in a value creation model is different from industry to industry. So the industry-based approach, including by using the SASB standards, surfaces decision-useful information in a cost-effective way for preparers. So with that whirlwind introduction and context setting, let's go to the interview uh, that Norie conducted with Hiroshi, which we recorded in advance. 
こんにちは。アイファレス財団アジアオセアニア事務所の高橋です。本日は日本における ISSB ボードメンバーである小森博士を迎えまして、企業報告の質の向上、特にサステナビリティ関連事項と財務事項の報告のコネクティビティを達成することについて、小森理事のご意見をお聞きしたいと思います。その前に小森理事のご紹介をさせていただきます。小森理事は三井住友信託銀行にて証券代行コンサルティングサービスを立ち上げ、日本企業向けに ESG をベースとした IR と SR のコンサルティングをしておりました。そして当業務の中で投資家が企業報告の現状についてどのように捉えているのかをより詳しく知りたいという思いで、年金、積立金、管理運用独立行政法人、GPIF に転職し、チュワードシップ ESG 部門の立ち上げを担い、同部門を統括しておりました。2022年3月に GPIF を退任後、国際サステナビリティ基準審議会 ISSB に理事として2022年9月より業務を実施しております。それでは、これより小森理事への質問をさせていただきたいと思います。それでは一つ目のご質問なんですが、IASB と ISSB のボードのコネクティビティ、そして両ボードによって策定された基準のコネクティビティ、さらに報告のコネクティビティについて、ISSB はどのように捉えていると思われますでしょうか。はい、のりえさんありがとうございます。非常にあの重要なポイントだと思っていますけれどもあのまず私自身は現在 ISSB のボードで、えー、他のメンバーと一緒に、えー、サステナビリティ開示基準を,を作成している議論の真っ最中ですで、まあ、この役割自体はですね、えー、IFAS 財団の中でしかできないものだと思っておりますけれども同時にコネクティビティも IASB と ISSB を両方を備えている IFAS 財団でなければできない役割だと実感しております。特に私たち、私は9月の1日から、あの、まあ、東京の A オフィスにいるわけですけれども、それ以前にマネジメントコメンタリーですとか、様々な形で IASB の方でも議論が進んでいたことに非常に意を強くしたところでもありますし、今後 ISSB、私を含めて ISSB 全体、全員がですね、この役割に向かって努力をしていきたいと思っています。はい、ありがとうございます。と次の,あの質問に入らせていただきたいと思います。インテグレイテッドレポーティングアンドコネクティビティカウンシル、通称 IRCC は IFRS 財団トラスティー、IASB と ISSB にアドバイスを提供する機関であります。具体的には IRCC は IASB と ISSB によって求められている報告事項をどのように統合させるべきなのか、また、統合報告フレームワークの原則と概念をどのようにして IASB と ISSB 双方のボードによるプロジェクトに反映させることができるのかに関する示唆を提供します。可能な範囲でお答えいただくことで構いませんが、IRCC のサポートを得ながらどのようにして ISSB は統合報告フレームワークの原則と概念を適用しようとしているのでしょうか。また、IFRS S1 もしくは S2 の中でサステナビリティ関連報告をビジネスパフォーマンスや財務成績に統合させることを可能にする要求事項の例示は何かございますでしょうかはいありがとうございますあの私まず一つは私たちの今のボードメンバーの構成ですけれども私自身はあの投資家のバックブランドで入っていますがえー、会計のバックグラウンドを備えた人間も5名入っておりますしたがってあのボードの構成自体がまずこの統合報告のフレームワークの原則と概念を適用するというスタンスの中で、えー、財務情報マテリアルな財務情報ですね、えー、にどうやって非財務の話を結合させるかということをもう最初から意図した
、ボードのメンバーの構成になっているというふうに感じております。したがって、あの、毎月の議論、あるいはそれ以外のタイミングでのスタッフを交えた議論の中でも常に会計 IAS1 ナンバーワンあるいはナンバーナイン、エイトといった会計基準とリンクをさせながらえー、まあよくサステナビリティの議論でよくありますけれども、あの、投資家が求めるもの以上のおこう議論になりがちなんですけれども、このボードメンバーにおいては、常にその会計の基準を念頭に置きながら、あサステナビリティのお、まあ、リスクと機械の認識のお話であったり、えー、今後のその、うん、価値向上ですね。え、につなげる、道筋、シナリオであったり、リスク分析のシナリオ、おそれから、うん、まあさ、気候変動問題を中心にした様々な、あ体、体制の問題ですね、えー、についても、あの、会計を基準に、会計の基準の考え方を頭に置きながら、まあ、議論をしています。ですので、まあ、具体的な例示ということよりも、むしろ私たちの毎月の議論自体が、そういったものがベースになっているということは、もし、例えば、ライブでお聞きいただければ、十分お分かりいただけるんではないのかなというふうに感じているところです。ありがとうございます。で、ここで、あの、のりえさんに私から質問なんですけれども、2022年11月に IFAS 財団が、アジア、オセアニア地域におきまして、統合報告を推進してきた組織を対象にしまして、統合報告並びに情報のコネクティビティに関するイベントを開催いたしました。このイベントを通じて、えー、主要なアウトカムが何だったということを、のりえさんはどう思われてますでしょうか。はい、ありがとうございます。えっとですね、あの、財務情報とサスティナビリティ情報を結合させながら、あの、包括的な企業報告を可能にする、統合報告フレームワークを支持する声が多かったものの、あの、まあ、原則主義で概念的であるため、あの、フレームワークで求められていることを実務に落とし込んで報告することは多くの企業の、あの、まあ、課題であるっていう声が多くありました。例えば、部署間の情報の連携が必ずしもできていないため、報告書に何をあの報告するのかを決定するマテリアリティ評価や、報告書内の情報をコネクティビティを持って報告することに課題を感じている企業が依然として多い状況が伺えました。ただし、これは、あの、同時に企業にとって、まあ、報告書の質を向上させるための機会でもあるというふうにも考えています。であのー、企業内の部署間の連携を高め報告のコネクティビティを達成させるためにはまず取締役会やマネジメントは統合的思考に基づいて企業のこう全体像を的確に把握をし最適な事業戦略の策定や資源配分への意思決定をすることが大切であると思います。そしてこれらが適切に報告されるように企業報告を取締役会やマネジメントの経営課題の一環として位置づけられるようにすることが必須であります。しかしながら現状においては取締役会やマネジメントによる企業報告への関与がまだ薄いという課題が浮き彫りになっています。そのため、これらの課題を解決するためにいくつかアイアファレス財団へ期待を寄せる声があり、ありまして、例えばサステナビリティ事項がどのようにこう財務に影響を及ぼすのかに関する具体的な例示を示してほしいというリクエストや、統合報告フレームワークや統合的思考原則を企業が実践しやすくするためのガイダンスをアイアファレス財団に作成をしてほしいという声がありました。あの全体的な印象としましては特に IASB と ISSB による統合報告フレームワークの今後の利用に関する声明発表など、まあ、これまでの統合報告に関する道のりをこう支持する声があの多かったと思います。将来を見据えると、サステナビリティ情報と財務情報が結合性を持って報告されるためには、統合的思考に基づいた企業経営と企業報告の実現がされるよう、アイアファレス財団として支援できることを具体的に検討する必要性があると思いました。
。これは統合報告を実践することにより、企業と投資家に多くの便益をもたらすからだと思います。はい、以上があの私の感想でありました。はい、ありがとうございます。私もあの当日の議論を聞いていて、あの同じ印象ですね。まあ、メリットもあれば、まだまだ企業にとっても難しい課題が依然として残っているんだなっていうのを実感した次第です。まあ、最初の特に一番最初にあのおっしゃった、えー、っとこう。原則そうですね。えー原則主義であり概念的なためっていうのは、まあもともと、あの、こう、6つの資本のお話の図自体が、あそういう難しさをかかあの抱えているんですけれども、まあ企業の方々へのアドバイスとしては、まずは、あの、その、I I、IRRC、統合報告のフレームワークに則っ,った形で、えー、レポートの作業に取り掛かっていただき、で、ただ、あの、いろいろ社内での議論、あるいは投資家との議論を、が深まっていくと、あの、自分たちの会社にユニークな多分要素というのは必ずあるはずですので、えー、少しずつかもしれませんが、その6つの、おこう、ダイアグラムから外れる展開、議論の展開もあってもいいというふうに思っていますし、まあ、おそらくそのことによって、より、えー、企業の中での議論が深まり、あるいは投資家との議論も深まっていく。で、投資家が最終的には適切に、えー、企業さんの、おまあ、統合報告の目的である資本コストの低減であり、えー、価値創造シナリオの向上ですね、えー。そういったものにつなげていくためのお分析資料になっていくのではないかなというふうに、えー、思っています。で、そのためにはですね、先ほど申し上げた通り、やはり、あの、経営トップの自らのこう関与、特に自分が持っている、事業に対する思いですとか、この後の戦略ですとか、ビジネスモデルの検討ですとか、いろいろおーテーマを挙げればキリがないんですけれども、あの、そのことを、取締役会であったり、えー、中間のマネジメント層に落とし込んでいかないと、なかなかレポートの質が上がっていきませんし、最終的には経営のクオリティも上がっていかないっていうことを、投資家の経験としては感じています。で、ここの部分はですね、あのー、ガバランスのお話なんですね。つまり、あのー、情報開示を何のためにやるかというのは、一重に、その価値創造あのストーリーを,を強化する、あるいは投資家に自社を適正に評価してもらいたいということからですので、えー、統合報告を含めた全体の,あの企業報告の戦略というか、まあ、目的であったり、その手段も含めてですけれども、やはり常に取締役会であったり、マネジメント層が関与しながら、まあ、レベルの向上につなげていくっていう,う体制、えー、ガバナンスの体制になりますけれども、ここがやはり重要だと思っています。で、3点目の、あの、アイマス財団への期待ですけれども、例えば、これは、あの、ベストプラクティクスの事例集を作ったりすることでカバーできる部分はあると思いますけれども、やはり最終的には CEO の、おに、えー、事態を理解してもらう必要がありますので、まあ、そのことを私たちのレベルで、えー、できることはないかどうかっていうのは、まあ、この後の議論のポイントにもなってくるかなというふうに思っています。ありがとうございます。ありがとうございます。あの、大変示唆に富むアドバイスをいただいて、あの、ありがとうございます。はい。で、あの、最後の質問になりますが、えっと、まあ、今後の統合報告の実践は、この企業のこうパフォーマンスの向上につながるとお考えになられますでしょうかはい、あの、実は GPIF におりましたときも、えー、こういった企業さんのその開始がですね、どういうふうに、あの、こう、パフォーマンスの向上であり、最終的にはその価値創造をストーリーにつながっていくかっていうのを、まあ、アカデミアの人たちも含めて、えずっと議論をしていましたが、えー、少なくとも私が退任するまでは結論は出ていません。おそらく、先ほど申し上げたように、経営自体がアートであり、投資がアートであるということからすると、簡単にあの結論が出るお話ではないと、いう理解がまず重要だと思っています
、えー、その中で、えー、作った、まあ、例えば企業さんが一生懸命お作りになられた統合報告書がどういうふうにその向上につながるかっていう,こう思考ではなくって自社のパフォーマンスの向上につなげるためにどういうふうに自分たちが変わらなくてはいけないかどういうふうに自分たちが今どこのステージにいるかっていうのをしっかり分析することも必要ですし今後どういうふうに何が足りないから変わっていかなくてはいけない社内の体制をどうやって変えていかなくちゃいけないあるいはビジネスモデルそのものを変えていかなくてはいけない場面も出てくるかもしれませんがそういった議論をするためのツールが、まあ、統合報告統合思考でもありますのでぜひ、えー、少しちょっと見方を変えてですね、えー、企業自社のパフォーマンスにつなげる議論をした結果の統合報告というものになってくるとよりえー、クオリティが高まると思いますし、投資家も歓迎する情報開示になっていくと思います。あのー、言っている自分としては簡単に言ってますけれども、これ誰にとっても、あのー、非常に難しく、難しい問題で、もしかしたら不可能なのかもしれませんが、まあ、私たちの今の ISSB、IASB、IFAS 財団の立場としては、この難しい、えー、開示の役割を会計と、サステナビリティの両面からリンクさせるコネクティビティさせるという非常に重要な役割を担っておりますので、えー、まさに私たちにとってもジャーニーでありますし、まあ、その分こう新しい役割任務を果たすべく毎日ワクワクしながらこの業務に取り組んでいるところですありがとうございました大変あの心強いお言葉いただきましてどうもありがとうございましたありがとうございます Well, thank you to Norie and Hiroshi for that.、Uh, it, it, very interesting to hear Hiroshi's perspective, former head of stewardship at GPIF, the world's largest pension fund. And a reminder, as he said, that this is, really is about corporate governance. And、uh, it's a good reminder that ESG indeed starts with the G in a sense. Now, we've been, we heard in the first two episodes of the series about what to report. And we've just been hearing really about how to report, including with the integrated reporting framework. Let's look now deeper into the internal processes around how to gather sustainability data, verify it, raise it up to the level of financial reporting. Now, COSO established guidance on how to achieve effective internal control over financial reporting, or ICFR. Which is required by the Sarbanes Oxley Act for US filers. And the framework has become very widely used around the world for financial reporting. Now, as you'll hear, COSO is about to release new guidance for internal control over sustainability reporting, or ICSR. Now, this is pre recorded again, a presentation by the Institute of Management Accountants, IMA, with an introduction from Bob Hurst, founding IASB member and a former chair of FASB. Let's listen. Hi, I'm Bob Herz.、Uh, some of you may remember me as one of the original members of the IASB,、uh, and then for many years as chairman of the U.S. Financial Accounting Standards Board, the FASB.、Uh, I've also been quite involved over the years in many organizations and projects related to、uh, sustainability reporting. And in that regard,、uh, I and、uh, my colleague, Shari Litton from the Institute of Management Accountants.、Uh, I want to talk to you today about、uh, a forthcoming、uh, study and guide on applying the COSO internal control integrated framework、uh, to build trust and confidence in sustainability information. With the establishment of the new ISSB, And with、uh, various jurisdictions、uh, coming out with detailed reporting requirements,、uh, you know, including the European Union with its CSRD and the US SEC with、uh, climate reporting,、uh, and the prospect of、uh, needing to have that externally assured in the future,、uh, the Board of COSO commissioned us to、uh, update and expand. 
uh, on our 2017 uh, guidance. And, uh, you know, very importantly, with the uh, establishment of the ISSB and it uh, now uh, well underway uh, in uh, creating a global baseline for sustainability information uh, and also together with the IASB advancing uh, integrated reporting between financial reporting and uh, sustainability reporting. Uh, we believe that having uh, sound and effective controls uh, over all the information uh, has become imperative. I'm now going to hand over to uh, my colleague and co-author on that, Shari Litton of the Institute of Management Accountants, uh, to go into uh, what we found and what the guidance will contain in further detail. Right. Thanks, Bob, and thanks, Neil, for the introduction. I'm so pleased to be here as part of the ISSB's educational series. I'm Shari Lynn. I am the Director of Research and Thought Leadership at IMA, the Institute of Management Accountants. In my role, I focus on financial reporting as well as sustainable business information and management. I'm so pleased to be here to introduce the work that we've done on behalf of COSO in applying the internal control integrated framework to sustainable business activities and reporting. So a lot of you may have questions, what is COSO? And some familiarity with it. So COSO is uh, a collaboration of five professional accountancy organizations. First is the American Accounting Association, and they primarily focus on the academics. There's the AICPA, FEI, the Internal Auditors, and IMA, Institute of Management Accountants, where I sit, and we tend to focus on accountants and finance professionals in business. And you can see that these organizations cover the interrelated branches of accounting, internal and external auditing, and corporate finance. Now, these organizations, although they were primarily US-based, um, many of them, including IMA, are now global. And indeed, the work and the reports and standards produced by COSO are indeed used worldwide across the globe. So a little bit of background on COSO and its history. COSO came about in the late 1980s when we saw significant concerns over the quality of financial reporting. There were concerns around misstated reports, fraudulent reporting, the need for restatements. We saw an uptick in regulatory enforcement actions and litigation. So these five accountancy organizations got together and said, what can we do? We need to promote a better means of accountability, of transparency, and most of all, trust and ethics to our profession and what we do. And the focus landed on the concept of internal controls, which speaks to process and system. So we can think about accounting and reporting information substantively, the actual data that gets reported. We think about the system that produces it and the enterprise-wide oversight means of delivering information and carrying out activities. And so in 1992, we had the very first integrated internal control frameworks. Moving forward to 2013, the framework was revised, modernized, and one key addition for our discussion today is the addition of the term non-financial to the types of objectives that an organization looks to carry out and that the framework could address. So by 2017, we saw the true acceleration of the area of sustainable business, which leads us here today. And questions and concerns on the systems that are producing or that began to be producing sustainable business or ESG information, and whether the framework as it existed could be applied and how it could be applied 
to promote and produce better quality information. Because one thing we all want who have been working hard in this space is to do our work in a way that does promote trust and transparency in what we're trying to do here. So three leaders, Bob Hers, Brad Monterio, and Jeff Thompson got together and they did a study. And they spoke to a number of companies and asked, are you addressing sustainability and how are you doing? And that is a key fact here is not just the reporting, but how to report again, those systems, the processes, how it's coming about within companies and to what extent they might be looking or intend to be looking to the internal control framework. Well, that's five or six years ago now, and it's time for a deeper dive, a more detailed look into the internal control framework how it exists and how it can be applied to this new world, the arena of sustainable business, reporting, information, activities, all towards the goal of indeed more sustainable businesses. And so what we've done with our targeted release in uh, March is a, as I say, a deeper dive. We look into the details of the framework itself the various components and principles and points of focus and say, how do we take what we already know how to do in the financial world, financial accounting and reporting world and apply it? Now, this is important because we're all trying to get to a place of connectivity and it's a system-wide look at connectivity. And so we think that a range of stakeholders, both internal and external, are going to be able to use our work, our publication, to have that cross-collaborative conversation about how to build these systems better so that we indeed produce more reliable, trustworthy information, which is everyone's goal. The framework itself, the COSO Internal Control Framework, is comprised of five components, which breaks into 17 principles, and breaks further down into points of focus. So that's the work that we did. We did that deeper dive. We looked at all of these different principles, how they work together, and how they apply to the world of sustainable business reporting and information. We talk about integration and integrated thinking principles. And those all can be demonstrated or implemented, right? People are looking for the how-to, the implementation, and this provides a roadmap. And of course, it needs to be enterprise-wide. It needs to be integrated and holistic because if we want quality reporting, it needs to reflect the actual underlying activities that are happening at an organization. So again, we're very excited to be part of the team bringing this report. Our target date is March. We're hopeful that we'll make that. And so on behalf of all my co-authors, I'm so pleased to have shared this with you today. Great, let's go now to a an interview that I did earlier with Koshik Chatterjee uh, from Tata Steel in India. Uh, so Koshik is CFO. He's a board member of Tata Steel. He's a new trustee of the IFRS Foundation. And Koshik is also a longtime member of the Integrated Reporting Council and a board member of the Value Reporting Foundation. Now, you're going to hear Koshik really tie it all together. Jurisdictional requirements, integrated reporting, internal processes, and the industry-based approach. Uh, Koshik was going to join us live, but unfortunately was called away and I was able to catch up with him earlier. So here he is. Koshik, thank you very much for joining us. To start with, how do you see the ISSB fitting into a jurisdiction such as India, which is already well advanced in using the GRI standards as well as developing your own reporting requirements around sustainable development goals? Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, I think Indian companies and Indian regulators have been um, promoting the importance of sustainability reporting for some time. And as we speak, the 
Securities Exchange Board of India, uh, the SEBI has already mandated if a format of uh, sustainability reporting for the, the uh, top thousand companies listed in India, uh, which is uh, on a on a template what they call as the um, the business responsibility and sustainability reporting, which is a BRSR, which kind of uh, adopts the best of global standards and uh, uh, ensures that the the stakeholders, readers, analysts get a full 360 degree view of the company's uh, financial and non-financial uh, uh, part of the business. And uh, it is just not, while it is in a questionnaire format, it's uh, just not about reporting data, but it's also about the principles, the governance, the strategies, the risk and opportunities, much as we see the same being articulated uh, in the ISSB through the uh, TS TCFD framework. So I think that once the um, ISSB standards become uh, more and more developed, uh, Indian companies uh, and Indian regulators will look forward to adopt the best practices globally and ensure that the companies report uh, on, on those standards uh, by whatsoever name called. And I think that the, the substance will be more critical uh, than just the, the format or the reporting format. And I think by doing that, Indian companies would effectively align with the global standards. And I think that will become very critical. Uh, and for India, which is looking to become a larger and larger economy, uh, where international stakeholders, investors, rating agencies, and others have a lot more stake in the future, such reporting standards would be greatly be useful. And I'm sure that the Indian companies will look forward towards it. That's very helpful. Thank you, Koshik. And indeed, the, that global baseline will really put companies around the world on the same level of data, a global language uh, of sustainability, giving access to capital, access to markets. Now, Tata Steel was the first Indian company to transition to the integrated reporting framework. And today, India has become one of the strongest countries in terms of integrated reports. How can the integrated reporting framework help to integrate traditional financial reporting with sustainability related financial disclosure? Yeah, so uh, when we look at integrated reporting framework, the IR framework, which still continues to be relevant under the ISSB um, a process, uh, I think it gives a, a very good view of the six capitals. And obviously the financial capital is one of one such capital. Uh, which is how the financial capital actually influences the rest of the uh, five capitals and how do the five capital influence the financial capital. So that interdependency comes across very strongly in an IR framework and the management is forced to think, management and the boards are forced to think in terms of this uh, interoperability of the uh, financial reporting and non-financial reporting, and how do the best use of resources ensure the future sustainability of the company? And I think therefore it is a fantastic tool uh, for companies, boards, uh, including the investors to look at a company from an IR lens because that's very holistic. It is principle-based, but it is something which gives a very robust platform for companies to report it, especially if one goes through an assurance process as well of the of the data that is being used. That's very interesting indeed, uh, tying it into the assurance process and the, the quality of data. You know, one of the ISSB's requirements once phased in is to report financial data at the same time as sustainability data. So to continue that thought process about the quality and assurance, what can a company do in terms of governance and processes and even the teams involved to achieve that, that reporting sustainability related information at the same time at the same level of quality? Yeah, so I think uh, um, what I mentioned earlier in India, the BRSR report is a report that has to be published along with the financial performance. And therefore, it is important for us to look at it from that perspective and ensure that uh, it doesn't come in as a, on top as a separate sustainability information data, clouding out the whole process of 
in the linkage between the financial reporting and the non-financial reporting. So I think it is important that the regularity of reporting of sustainable sustainability and its indicators is as important as reporting the financial data. So in my view, we are perhaps uh, just at the threshold of seeing a huge convergence of financial reporting and non-financial reporting into what I would say as the corporate reporting uh, of the company. And therefore, that I think uh, will drive uh, the convergence and that will ensure that the companies report the non-financials along with the financials. And like what we have, the financial statements, the balance sheet and the profit and loss and cash flows, etc. We will have or we should have the non-financial reporting along with it so that a stakeholder gets a 360 degree view of both the financial and non-financial indicators. Well, I like that a 360 degree view, indeed a, a complete picture of performance. So a last question, you know, the ISSB's industry-based approach will yield information most useful for, for investor decisions. It's also cost-effective, efficient for companies because they can focus on an industry-specific subset of metrics do you see this requirement, the ISSB's requirement for companies to consider the SASB standards as helpful in identifying relevant ESG factors and metrics to disclose on them? I, I think, uh, you know, so far we, when we look at sustainability KPIs or reporting, if I look at the frameworks of multiple frameworks that existed, the problem was comparability within a sector or an industry. And by adopting a sector specific approach uh, and taking the SASB standards as a baseline, uh, I think this is a very helpful use because for investors, for companies themselves to look at peers and know that they are really benchmarking between apples and apples and not apples and oranges because each industry has its own uniqueness, nuances, challenges and risks, which cannot get always, of course, there is a broader baseline, but then there are standards for each. If I take, for example, the metals and mining, if there is a standards for metals and mining, it will be more comparable, it will be consistent, and it will give people who look at these a more holistic and a critical view of what to compare and what not to compare. So I think this is a very welcome approach. Uh, I think when it comes across, the users, the preparers will find it worthwhile. It will be more decision-centric reporting because I would get a sense of how am I vis-a-vis -vis my peers, uh, both globally and nationally, and others will see the same. And therefore, I think it will help in the pathway of improving the standards, uh, disclosure quality, and also taking decisions on the right path to become more sustainable. So I think this is uh, truly welcome. And I think we, I think the entire industry across sectors are waiting for these standards to come out. I, I That's really uh, helpful. And I like this term decision centric reporting. I think we should use that much more. Koshik, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. Well, I really did enjoy that conversation with Koshik. I always enjoy speaking to him. He has such a clear-eyed view of the sustainability reporting landscape, and I am definitely going to keep using that term decision-centric reporting to describe what we do, uh, uh, what the ISSB standards are intended to do. Uh, going on now, I invite now uh, Kirsten and Hiroshi to join me for a panel discussion and we'll take some audience questions. Um, and so um, Christian Simpson is head of investment stewardship and ESG with the Future Fund, Australia's sovereign wealth fund, uh, more than 243 billion Australian dollars under management, around 170 billion US dollars. And Christian is a member of the ISSB investor advisory group. And Hiroshi, of course, who you met earlier is our ISSB member, formerly Head of Stewardship at, at GPIF. Now, Kirsten, you have long been involved with integrated reporting. How did you get started with it? That's a great question. I guess I've always had a fascination with the linkages between strategic thinking, operational implementation, measurement of performance and communication with stakeholders. 
This has spanned my whole career uh, from my very first role as a graduate right through to the here and now. Uh, because of this, reporting standards and improving disclosure practices has always been close to my heart. Many years ago, I worked on the G4 standards for the GRI. I then helped lead the push for integrated reporting within Australia's pension fund industry, where I helped progress the discussion with peers, and I wrote the very first integrated report in the sector. I now sit on the other side of the table as an investor looking at companies' integrated reports. So what are some of the benefits, Kirsten, the benefits that integrated reporting brings to you now as an investor, uh, as a user of reports, but also the benefits to the preparers themselves? As a, as a large global institutional investor, we really value standardised information. We're interested in disclosures that give the most complete picture, so that 360 degree view of how a business model will generate value over the longer term. We also want to understand the full spectrum of risks and opportunities that surround an organisation. The integrated reporting framework itself helps organisations work through many of these really, really big questions. Um, while the framework itself helps organisations build out their disclosures to the market, there are also many internal benefits. For me, there's been great value in the conversations I've been able to have with my internal stakeholders. There's also inherent value in maturing of internal systems and management processes like we've heard discussed earlier today. Uh, but most of all, there's a real value in understanding the underlying complexity of issues that may not be apparent at first glance. So applying the integrated reporting framework is such a good process to go through from an organisational maturity and an integrated thinking standpoint. That's, it's very interesting to think about that as a, a, a maturing process, right? I mean, it's, this is not just ticking the boxes. This is really leading a company through a process of, of maturing in terms of sustainability. Now, Kirsten, you know, the, the, the GRI standards are very widely used in Australia and indeed right across Asia, Oceania. Um, how do you make the case that companies should use the ISSB's investor-focused standards as well? Yeah, I guess one of the most important steps on the reporting journey itself is defining who your stakeholders are. So who's the audience for your report? What information is important for their decision making? The GRI framework is great. I mean, it helps you map your stakeholders, asks you to look right across your stakeholder value chain. So looking at stakeholders, including community, employees, NGOs and regulators. As an investor, we're looking for information that's quite different to other stakeholders. We have a very specific set of needs and interests. We have a financial materiality lens, and we're ultimately interested in risk to value. So that's where the SASB indicators come in for us. Reporting on these indicators helps us assess the ESG risks and opportunities that impact on a company's financial condition and operating performance. So from an investor standpoint, um, we're also interested in comparable data across different types of companies, industries and sectors. So given we invest right across uh, the world, across different sectors in the economy, having a global baseline on key indicators allows us to look across our portfolio in a comprehensive and clear way. That's really helpful. And, and so in that sense, then the ISSB is, is complementary mm. to GRI. Uh, that, that is that, you know, in the building blocks approach that we have, they, the building blocks that really fit well together, right? And so if, uh, if an Australian company is already doing the GRI standards, you're not saying, well, stop that and start the ISSB. You're saying, no, this is surfacing information that's going to help us as, as investors, right? Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. I mean, we we are definitely interested in the other disclosures for other stakeholders. Um, we always value that information, but we have our own requirements. So we think that um, the standards are complementary. Absolutely. Great. Well, let's go to some audience questions now. 
And I have one for you, Hiroshi. Um, mm -hmm. Hiroshi, you said in the recording that the integrated reporting framework is quite conceptual. Um, how will the ISSB standards help track performance on what is really a very conceptual narrative tool? And also, how do you see the industry-based approach going with the uh, fitting into the integrated reporting framework? Yeah, thank you, Neil, for the great question. Um, listening to uh, Kirsten's answers, I recall my own experience at uh, GPIF. Uh, challenge, I think that the challenge of the company how to make a good uh, integrated report is, at the same time, a challenge of the investor side, like uh, two sides of the same coin. So I mean, uh, it is becoming more and more uh, important for investors uh, when they, uh, the longer they are, uh, whether companies in their portfolio make a good report or not. So uh, I think the integrated thinking and the integrated reporting need both the top-down approach and the bottom-up implementation inside one company. As I said in the video, in terms of top-down, perhaps companies can easily uh, or effectively understand the concept of the six capitals framework, but uh, it would be difficult to articulate and uh, embed top management passion to the businesses and the purpose in future uh, business model in short, mid and long term uh, strategies, etc. Uh, onto the reporting. So uh, this is the, the job only CEO can do inside the company as his own top-down approach. Then the ISSP standards uh, with SASB uh, as an industry-based approach, for example, uh, would work well, I hope, for the bottom-up implementation uh, to make self-assessment using uh, quantitative and qualitative disclosure framework at the same time. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Hiroshi. Uh, we have another audience question here that, and uh, let me take this one just quickly. And that is that it, will there be guidance on the location of uh, where the uh, ISSB metrics and indeed the SASB standards metrics are expected to be disclosed? The ISSB standards are agnostic on the exact location of disclosure. That is in order to be flexible and to fit with different jurisdictional requirements. Mm -hmm. What we are intending is that this sustainability reporting be in the same package as financial reporting, but exactly which document or which filing or exactly where we're, again, agnostic on that. Um, the, the, in, in terms of, uh, any guidance on that, we'll, the, we are going to be putting out uh, implementation guidance, illustrative examples, helping companies develop and shape the, their disclosures. So not the exact location, but certainly giving a lot of, a lot of guidance. Um, Kirsten, I'm going to put you on the spot in an audience question here about examples, examples of, of good integrated reports. And maybe I, I'm, you know, it, it, perhaps you can think of uh, any that you're familiar with. Um, as you were telling me, you know, this is a, a tight community. Uh, everyone works together, helps each other. Um, are there any examples that you can point to that people should look to for a good integrated report? Yeah, I mean, uh, most of the work I do is here in the Australian context in terms of deep dives on uh, reporting information and the engagement that follows um, those reviews. I would say that the banking sector here in Australia is quite good. So National Australia Bank, to name, name mm -hmm. a company, has a very good integrated report and they have been reporting for quite some time. So they're a great example to look at in terms of best practice. That's a that's a good one. Uh, uh, my one of my favorites is another bank uh, from Brazil, Itaú Unibanco. That's uh, oh, yeah. one that uh, I think uh, does a really good job of really showing those those connections and mm -hmm. uh, and building in the performance metrics with the narrative. Um, so, do you have any favorites, Hiroshi? Yeah, I think that uh, in case of uh, Japanese companies. 
I, I think that uh, both of uh, large cap companies and uh, uh, medium and small companies have uh, very good uh, integral reporting, such as from the uh, small and mid companies, I think that uh, I can say uh, that uh, Nabotesco, uh, which is uh, say globally business uh, companies with a high percentage of uh, uh, international investors, so uh, it is a great uh, opportunity for the companies to to make good uh, integral reporting and integral thinking for themselves at the end of the day. And also, I would say that, uh, uh, say, such as uh, Kirin Breweries and uh, Omron would be uh, uh, nice companies, uh, say, making, uh, say, showing development on their own year by year. So uh, this is a great effort. Uh, for the companies themselves. Uh, Kieran Breweries, one that I like for many reasons, but uh, <laughs> including integrated reporting and, and also a good user of the SASB standards, uh, right? Uh, oh, yes. So, yeah. Um, Kirsten, last question for you, and this one's from me. Uh, and, and really, I'd like to know if you have any final piece of advice for companies that might be just starting out on sustainability and on sustainability reporting. I have uh, two pieces of advice, so hopefully that's okay. Um, firstly, the best time to start reporting is today. Uh, you don't need to be perfect and you don't have to have everything completely sorted from day one. Start with what you've got, identify where the gaps are and progressively I progressively close those gaps over time. Um, it can be a little bit overwhelming when you start out. There are many different standards and it can seem complex, but when you start, um, you'll get more and more clarity. So definitely start today. Um, my final piece of advice would be understand who your stakeholders are and start having conversations with them about what they want and what they need in terms of disclosures. You'll learn a lot along the way those learnings will not only be valuable for your reporting journey, they'll also help your organisation be better prepared for what the future brings. That's a really, really good advice, Christian. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of this third and final part in the ISSB Corporate Reporting Webinar Series. The recording for this episode will be available here on the same web page as the previous two episodes, along with all the materials. You're also invited to the IFRS Sustainability Symposium next week, next Friday, February 17th in Montreal, which you can join either in person or virtually. I want to say thank you very much to all our speakers for part two but especially to my two guests joining live, Kirsten Simpson from the Future Fund, coming to us from Melbourne, Australia, and from Tokyo, ISSB member Hiroshi Komori. Thanks also to Norie Takahashi in Tokyo uh, with the IFRS Foundation for interviewing Hiroshi and for doing the Japanese translation. And special thanks to my colleague Sai Imamura in London for all her work organizing this series. I'm Neil Stewart from the IFRS Foundation. Goodbye. <laughs>